Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to the Pond Hunter Broadcast from the Under the Sea Radio Show on Blog Talk Radio. The Pond Hunter, in the pursuit of all things aquatic. Take a look into the world of koi ponds, water gardens, and the lifestyles of the aquatically obsessed. Meet the pros, hobbyists, and cover some no-nonsense pond advice straight from the field. The Pond Hunter, in the pursuit of all things aquatic. Here's your host, koi pond and water garden expert, Mike Gannon. Hey, 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 everybody. How's everybody doing? Hey, what's up, folks? How's it going? Welcome. Welcome to the Pond Hunter Radio broadcast, coming to you and broadcasting around the world from Blog Talk Radio. And tonight we're going to have with us a true pond pro. He's been in the industry for quite a spell now, and uh, he has tons of tips and information for us on how to prepare your pond for a successful winter season. Tom Deke will be with us tonight. Tom Deke is from TRD Designs out of Katona, New York, and he's going to lay it on us. Tom is going to give us the 411 on pond preparation. So, hey, Tom, are you on the line? Hey, Mike, how are you? I'm doing very well. How are you doing, Tom? I'm good. Am I coming in clear? You're coming in just fine. No problem. Great. Thanks so much for, for coming on. How are you doing? Good. My pleasure. My pleasure. Always my pleasure to be associated with you, my friend. Oh, well, thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> Not if you were on the golf course, though. How How is your golf game today? Well, my golf game wasn't so great today. <laughs> Uh-oh. But it was better than the CACs I played with in Michigan. How about that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you were associated with me on the golf course, you would not have had a, a very good day either. So, oh, well, what can you do? <laughs> well, it's so, funny. Um, while, I was, while I was on the course today, I happened to notice some of the ponds, uh, retention ponds, and uh, uh, I felt kind of sad for a lot of these environments that um, I know there'll be a lot of fish loss because of the lack of care that goes on uh, in the public areas where ponds are, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, private homeowners who really uh, know that pond care for the winter starts in the fall. And uh, I was seeing kind of a lack of that today and knowing that once winter hits, it's extremely hard to take care of your pond for the winter months. Yeah, I mean, winter sneaks up on people like that, and, you you know, you can have decent weather where you're, you're like, ah, you know, I'll just get to it next week, and then it's like winter just hits, and you're you're stuck inside, or it just gets, you know, the conditions are such that you can't really do much with your pond, and then you're you're in a, you're in a bind, basically, if, if you don't prepare for those kind of things. Oh, exactly. If, if you don't have a chance to do the number one thing, and that's get all the organic matter uh, out of the debris out of the pond, that's really the one factor that's really going to injure the fish over the long-term uh, winter months. Um, you know, you need to be able to have a, an environment where there's not a lot of uh, chance for that organic matter to cause problems for the fish. So that yeah. needs all to, that really needs to be removed. That's really the number one thing to do for winter prep for a pond is to uh, keep all that again. You know, cut back all your plants, your marginals, uh, sink your lilies down uh, below freezing, and um, remove as much organic matter as possible. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, and you know you create a lot of amazing ponds and uh, water gardens, water features. You guys do a lot of stuff, actually. You you do plantings and decks and patios and and all sorts of amazing landscape um, projects. Are are you guys and you do the surfaces as well? So what you're talking about doing, um, you guys, your your clients right now are, are getting services to prepare their ponds for winter. Well, we actually haven't even started our winter closings yet. I like to keep. The water features, whether it's a pond or a pond list or a fountainscape, I like to let my clients enjoy them as long as they can possibly enjoy them. And hopefully that's just around Thanksgiving time where a lot of family is at houses and they really can sit back and enjoy uh, the water features still at that point. Now, we have had 
you know, a few years, even a few years back, where we've had those October 31st snowstorms that have killed Halloween yeah. for the kids, but it's also killed us in the industry because, uh, you know, I think the last one we had, that snowstorm, we had snow on the ground here in Zone 6 up in New York until probably two weeks afterwards, and that really, really set us back as far as uh, our maintenance schedule. But normally, and I'll say normally, and hopefully we have a normal year, um, we really like our homeowners uh, to enjoy their water features right up into Thanksgiving. And then it's a mad rush for us to get things closed down. For those who close it down, whether you're closing it down or you're not closing it down is a personal decision um, uh, based on, you know, basically, for me, I always tell people, if you do not have a generator, uh, do not run your uh, water feature over the winter. Uh, if you have a generator yeah. and you can, you know, because we've had those periods of times where you really need to um, have power, you can, you know, you can have some really big issues if you don't have a generator keeping uh, your water feature moving if you have no power. But um, in saying that, uh, you know, for those who close down, it's also a sense of security as well that there can be no problems. <laughs> so... Uh, right. But I do like I do like to keep them open as long as possible, and I like to open them as well in the spring as soon as I possibly can. Yeah, you know I I think when it comes to winter preparation, that that's actually one of the the biggest questions, or maybe even the main question um, before you start even getting anything else is: Do you run your pond, or don't you run your pond during the winter time? Um, you know, and like you said, it is kind of a personal choice of the, you know, the pond owner. Um, I tend to encourage people to run them. Um, you know, a lot of that has to do with the fact that I install, we install systems that, that can run year-round. Of course, you know, you've got to be careful with extreme weather, single-digit weather, stuff like that. But, um, you know, given the general uh, conditions, they should be able to run year-round really without too much issue. What do you recommend for most people as far as whether to run or not run their ponds? Wow, that's a real tough one. Um, I've had clients that run them um, through the winter, and I've had clients that have decided to shut them down. Um, the same client can sometimes choose to, you know, run one year and shut down another year. Um, a couple things yeah. to, you know, consider. One is cost of running your system, of course. You know, that, that can be a, a factor for some people. Um, uh, the other thing is, um, you know, the sense of beauty that you get in running a water feature with all the ice formations and the, I mean, it changes every day. Just the sheer beauty of a water feature, a waterfall and, and the ice formations is, it's breathtaking. Uh, to see, yeah. and, and especially at night when things are lit with the lighting that we, you know, the uh, LED lighting that we use. Uh, so, that, oh, yeah. you know, it's a tough decision people need to make. And um, still, I think a lot of it revolves around uh, a sense of security and whether you have a backup uh, a, a generator. Um yeah. Here in the Northeast, anyway, I think, you know, we can get so cold that you can have some, you know, really bad things, uh, you know, pipes freezing. And I, last year we had a water feature with two broken two-inch check valves. And yeah. we've never had that before. This water feature has run ever since its inception back in uh, 2008. And last year was the winter, worst I've ever oh, seen up here. And that... Brutal. Well, that was two two check valves that uh, totally fr uh, froze, which I've never seen yeah. before. But so things can happen. Yeah, and you know, there's there's I'm sure you deal with all types of ponds and all types of systems, and some ponds need to be shut down. There are some filter systems and other ways of constructing ponds that you just you cannot run them year round. So of course you're going to advise your customers, hey man, you know you you need to shut it down. Um, I, I that always also, think that, that that also is a concern with how the pond is constructed or the water feature is constructed. If you have um, uh, 
if you have a lot of edges that uh, if you get ice buildup may overrun the edge of the pond, then next thing you know, you come out and there's no water left because it's frozen and the water hasn't gone down the you know slope and into the basin or into the pond. Uh, then it's overrun the pond because of some ice damming. That can be an issue too. So I think that keeping it open also depends on how your pond is constructed, how your water feature is constructed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I'm seeing ponds that have bead filters, canister filters, box filters, UV systems, yeah. to me, those, those cannot run you around. I, I no, never you... recommend that for anybody. No. Shut it I, off. I love, I love the biological filter, filtration, uh, uh, filtration that we have. Uh, I try to incorporate that in almost every water feature we do. But listen, you know, yeah. the bottom line is when you when you have a uh, water feature, um, you, there's still a number of check uh, a checklist that you really need to go through before you head into winter, and it really starts in the fall. And a lot yeah. of it, a lot of it, uh, based around you know keeping the organic material out of the pond, um, and uh, you know again, as I said before, cutting back your your marginals, um, you know also. Um, Changing for the fish, for the koi, especially just changing your uh, your fish uh, food to a um, wheat germed uh, food. Uh, right. Cold water using a cold water bacteria, so you're still getting some organic breakdown with the bacteria as the pond, uh, you know, goes towards 50 degrees. Um, right. You know. And it's, you know, bef- before we get to the the fish and plants and stuff. I think it, it, once we've decided that we're going to run a pond or a customer is going to run their pond for the entire season, um, I think it, what is a, an important step in preparing them for that is the just doing the maintenance of their equipment. So let's, right. let's talk about preparing pond equipment for the winter a little bit. And um, let's start with, like, with the heart of the system, the pumps. Um, if somebody, what is a typical process that somebody should look at doing in preparing their pumping system for uh, for winter time. So if you're going to be shutting your pond down, you're going to be removing your pump, and you're going to be also removing, you know, your filter pads and, um, uh, you know, cleaning them out and storing them for the winter. But taking your pump out is crucial that, uh, that you really need to uh, take your pump and probably put it in something like a five-gallon bucket of water to keep the seals from drying out over the winter. A lot of people don't do that, and uh, the seals uh, uh, get it dried out, and the pump is never the same after that happens. Uh, so if you're yeah. going to remove your pump, um, you know, you really do need to uh, put it to in- inside where it's not going to freeze. Put it in your garage, put it in a five-gallon bucket, keep it uh Keep it wet for the winter, and then I suggest that you, uh, if you're going to do that, you still need to be able to then uh, put in the pond something that's going to recirculate some water, and that would be something like uh, we use the Aquaforce. We keep it on the upper levels of a pond so that moves the water. Uh, it doesn't stir up the water down below where the fish like it to be calmer. Uh, so it's not yep. drawing and changing temperatures from down below. It's kind of just keeping everything moving up on the top and keeping it open. Uh, so we okay. really like to use the Aquaforce to that. But, you know, um, you do need to remove that pump. And I would now suggest somebody, pulling the filters out. Okay. If somebody's going to run their, their system year-round, if you have a customer who does want to run it and wants mm-hmm. to enjoy it during the winter time and, and have that experience of, just the, the dynamic beauty of, of a ponder in winter. Um, I, I would probably suggest that they're, they're cleaning and maintaining the intake areas on the pumps because you can get that buildup, uh, you know, at the intake. And uh, especially if your pump has screening or sponges or something on it, because, um, you know, some people do use those kind of pumps. That it'd be really important to make sure your pump intake is nice and clean going into the winter time. Um, now, if somebody has an external pump, Tom, can they run those year-round? Do you recommend that? If, I, if, I would if not that recommend that. I, I think an external pump or an external filtering system uh, is just um, a, a problem just waiting to happen. Um, I would not suggest that. Okay, so they should be disconnecting those and draining those and uh, winterizing the equipment. What about oh, um, if somebody is, is running their 
their uh, system year round and they have a submersible pump, do they have to worry about the, the pump freezing up at all because of weather conditions? For a, well, it really depends on how deep their pond is. Um, you know, typically here up in Zone Six, we're not going to get more. More, you know, at a really bad winter, what are we going to get? Possibly nine or ten inches of freeze on a really bad winter. But um, a submersible pump, if it's down to two feet, you should be fine. Um, okay. But but uh, you know, you may look at that that differently. I'm not sure. We don't really have um, a lot of applications like that. Um, most of our pumps, and I try to create our um, vaults and our um, uh, our pumps uh, down in a um, area that it's two and a half to three feet. I just like that extra sense of uh, depth. Uh, even though the pond level may be at two feet, we like to put the uh, filter, you know, the pumping area down, you know, below that. And I know that we're absolutely uh, fine using that depth, and it's never going to freeze to that point down there. Okay. Let's say somebody uh, is going away during the winter time. They're taking vacation. Can they just unplug their pump, or do you think it, they run the risk of, like, like you have seen, burst check valves and, and problems with the pipes? Well, again, I think that's um, it. Really depends on the construction of the water feature. Um, and how far down that pump is. I've seen pumps that have stayed in all winter, and I've seen them come out fine. And I've uh, I've seen very few, though, uh, that haven't come out fine, even because we don't really get that freezing down to the level. If a pump is down at two feet, we really don't get that amount of freezing that's really going to cause da- damage to the pump. But I still think it's a good idea just to... Just, uh, to get in the habit of pulling your pump if you're going to shut your feature down, water feature down. Okay, yeah. Now, what about um, skimmers? I mean, that's that's such a an important filter component. How do you recommend preparing your skimmer or maintaining your skimmer going into the winter season? Uh, shutting down or keeping open? Uh, keeping it open. Just what what type of general maintenance would somebody want to do on their skimming? I think you'd keep your aerator and possibly your heater right near your skimmer opening to make sure that that does not freeze where the intake of water is going to be coming into your skimmer. So either your aerator or your heater or both uh, should be close to that opening. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, that's that's a really good tip. And I think when if when people are getting ready for the winter, you know, the skimmer is a, is a place where a lot of accumulation of debris happens. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, make sure your your netting is nice and clean, your your brushes and your sponges just give everything a really good clean out. And uh, I'm sure you've noticed that at the bottom of a skimmer, <laughs> you get that muck that, that can build up. And, you know, in mine... My, my pond is right under an, an oak tree, so I get acorns that build up inside the skimmer. So we always try to give those a really good clean out. So that stuff, which is kind of hidden from sight, sometimes you don't really think about it, but but you don't want, what you were saying about accumulating organics, you want to make sure that stuff is not stuck inside your skimmer um, for the winter time. Exactly. Uh, just because it's winter, if you're going to keep your system open, doesn't mean that you don't have to open that lid and still clean that basket uh, because there's going to be debris in that basket. Uh, and you really do need to keep that clear um, to make sure that there's no hold up of the amount of water that's getting to the pump, you know, so keep your flow uh, correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's really important. And, uh, it- a funny little side note, when uh, people are going into their skimmers, especially once we start getting into these colder months, don't be surprised if you find a frog sitting on top of your, sitting inside your skimmer. <laughs> they, I'm uh, sure you've seen two. that. Yeah, yeah, they like to uh, kind of congregate inside there. I think it's that pocket of warm air, uh, warm warmer air that they're that they're going for inside there. Mm-hmm. It's pretty funny. I. My guys, uh, every once in a while, I hear a little scream because, for whatever reason, they're pond professionals, but they, they're scared of frogs. And I'm like, uh-huh, okay, they just found a frog. <laughs> I've never heard of that before, but uh, uh, if you're going to be in this business, you should be uh, not afraid of frogs. Yes, they're they're nope, going to be nope. at your pond before you're done building it. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and then from the skimmer, you know, everything goes around to, to a, a biofilter. Um, I use a lot of biofalls. I know you do too. What's the kind of maintenance process for a biofalls uh, when you're heading into winter? What do you recommend people do to prepare those? Well, again, that's another filtered area. You know, you have a, a, a biofalls filter that um, should be either kept clean or, in some cases, removed. Uh, since you have less debris, hopefully moving through the system, um, you're looking for an area that's not going to clog up. You want as much movement from the bottom to the po- uh, from the top to the bottom as possible. So, uh, in my in a lot of the clients that we have will just take that pad right out. Uh, sometimes we'll even take the uh, charcoal um, out as well, uh, so that we have as much quick movement of water from top to bottom as possible. Okay, that's a good tip. So the, the big sponges um, or the, the mechanical filter material that you have inside your biofalls should be taken out, maybe just cleaned up and put into storage, possibly to use during the spring. Or you may want to, if it's not in good shape, it's a good time of year to throw that stuff out too and uh, sure. order some new filter media. Right. And, again, you know, that's sitting pretty much right up at uh, the very top. You know, it's up close to the air temperature and it's around where, you know, ice buildup is around the edge of the biofalls. Um, so uh, is it a possibility that it could get, you know, layered over and um, dammed up? Sure it is. So it just depends on the construction again and whether you have, um, you know, an open biofalls or do you have something with a cover over the top of it may make a difference in that. But I like to take out the pads itself. I like to take out that filter so that we don't have any uh, possibility of that, you know, freezing up. Uh, it has been a few. T- it's been a few years since this has happened, but I've had to go out a few times during the middle of the night just to loosen things up. Um, when we've been down consistently at, you know, four or five or uh, 10 degrees below zero some nights, and that's happened uh, where you start yeah. to get, even though you have a heater and you have an aerator, you still have that amount of buildup that you're starting to uh, getting some ice buildups that's going to move the water outside your, you know, your envelope. And that can be a problem if you're, if, especially if that happens at night. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You don't want to uh, drain your pond overnight. That is not nice to wake up to. Um, we deal with many different types of ponds. Um, so on a lot of times I'll see people who are using UV systems, the ultraviolet systems. Um, I don't think those should be kept out all winter. What, what do you, how do you um, think people should deal with those once we get to this time of year? Uh, no, the UV lights should come in. The bulbs should come in. Um, it, there's no reason for the – they're really not pro- providing you any type of a beneficial, uh, uh, you know, service at that point. So they're not really uh, something that's working for you. So you might as well go ahead and uh, uh, pull them inside, um, uh, you know, re- remove the unit, not just the bulb, uh, you know, the pressurized filters can crack. Um, uh, even the ion clarifiers, I, I think they should come in. Um, the all-in-one type of filtration units, those should come in. Um, you know, things like that, uh, as well as your pumps, um, really should come in for the winter. Yeah. All those things should be removed and completely drained. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I've even made the mistake of not fully draining um, UVs or even little canisters over the last 20 years. I mean, it's bound to happen. And, you know, they always break. They always crack. So um, people got to really drain those completely. And what makes it easy this time of year to deal with those those type, uh, that type of equipment is is planning for it on the front end when you're constructing your pond. a lot of people get these UV systems, they put them in line and they don't really think of, Hey, you know, six months from now, seven months from now, I got to take this, I got to remove it. So I would even recommend using union fittings when you're installing the UV so you can take them out really easily and just yeah. connect those lines right back together and keep on um, running your system. And you, right. you mentioned ionizers too, which is another type of algae control. Um, 
this uh, and you you feel that this is a good time of year to unplug them and remove them? I do. I don't. You know, they're not really going to provide much of a benefit for us over the winter. Um, I think the units themselves will last longer if they're brought in, and then you can rehook them back up in the spring. But I think it's just a uh, you know a sense of security that. Um, uh, you, you have components that are outside that um, are open to the elements, and um, uh, they're harsh elements some years, very harsh, uh, as last yeah. year was. So, you know, to be on the safe side, it would take those uh, iron clarifiers in, and uh, as well as those filters and the UV clarifiers, things like that should just come in. You know, for another, people who, another thing, uh, Mike. That's another thing that's really important um, uh, it, that makes a big difference is, um, you know, when you have aeration stones in the pond or the dip, you know the big plates that uh, are used for aeration, those really need to move, be moved from the uh, from the bottom of the pond where we want them during the growing season to the upper parts of the pond. Um, you know, you really don't want to be moving that lower water, as I was saying before. You want that to be nice and calm. So moving your aeration up to the upper portions of your pond uh, will make a big difference on how, you know, your fish are settling into that nice calm area uh, where they're, you know, in um, hibernation. Right. You know, um, and going back to the ionizers, what... When people are running those during the season, you know, you're not going to use it during the winter, but a lot of people aren't familiar with the ionizer. What what are those used for? What does the ionizer do for the pond? Well, the ionizer is just another method of reducing algae. Um, so it uh, pr- pretty much prevents the uh, buildup of algae. It's a, uh, uh, an ionizer is... Uh, uh, you know, throwing, and uh, maybe you can even explain this better for me because it's a it's very kind of topic that is not the easiest to explain normally, but it's a, a, a release of a the ion that is going to help reduce the, the makeup of how an algae uh, cell uh, builds. And, um, yeah. you know, um, we've been using them for years. We've seen some good... Um, success with them on some years and some years less um, as you can have a lot of you can have a big algae year and a not, not so big algae year but the ionizer is uh, uh, something that really can reduce the amount of buildup of algae that happens in your pond okay yeah and I, it, it targets string algae so if people are looking at utilizing those for green water conditions they're really not going to get any performance out of it and uh it's like what you said it just releases a low level of uh copper into the water which algae just can't handle it so it it dies which is a good thing now there's a probe in there so when you're taking it out for the winter time that probe usually gets uh, some scale building up on it and you can You can brush those probes, clean them up, dry them off, and like you're recommending, put them away for the winter because they really aren't going to offer you too much um, algae control during the winter months, and all you're really going to be doing is wearing down that copper probe, which they can, you know, to to replace them, you don't want to really have to do that or pay for that more than once a year. And if you clean it, dry it, put it away, springtime comes around and you, you put those in on your nice clean pond and it helps to control algae all season long. Um, Mm -hmm. I know we don't deal a lot with these, but but I think we need to talk about it because there's listeners out there who do have these pieces of equipment, which is the bottom drain. So the bottom drain, is there anything, do you deal with those at all as far as uh, the winterizing of ponds? You know, we don't have a single system with a bottom drain. That's not really in our method of construction. Um, yeah. I, you know, it's, um, I know it's been around for a long time and I know it has its benefits, but it's not yeah. something that we're really familiar with. Um, uh, so I can't really answer. I can help you on that. Yeah. I don't do bottom drains personally either because it's just, uh, I think on paper, the bottom drain is a, is a good concept and you're right. It does have applications in the pond industry, in my opinion, They're better suited for concrete ponds or really for breeders and uh, retailers and, you know, guys who are are 
selling fish or breeding fish, that's where a bottom drain can really come in handy. I, I think in the typical backyard pond, especially in areas like ours, um, we get a lot of debris that can get into a pond. So the, the bottom drain to me represents a liability in many ways. Um, I'm not a big proponent of using them, but what I do recommend for people that have them is that it's time to actually turn off the feed from your bottom drain. You don't want to keep drawing water down through that uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, if it gets clogged up, you need to get down to the bottom of your pond to unclog it, which is a big job. And pond professionals love working, but they're probably not going to want to dive to the bottom of your pond during the middle of winter to unclog your bottom drain. So I'd recommend you know, taking the bottom drain suction offline and uh, not really dealing with it during that time of year. But another thing is that it circulates water from the bottom to the top of the pond. And you touched on that with the aeration advice. You don't want to take that bottom water and move it to the top of the pond during the winter time. During the rest of the season, it's good, uh, but not during the winter time. So for people who do have bottom drains, let's turn them off. Um, and not utilize them during the winter because if you do have an issue, boy, is that just the wrong time of year to have to deal with the bottom drain issue. It's never any fun dealing with those. I don't recommend using them. I know you don't recommend using them uh, for typical backyard pond install uh, applications, but the aerator, which you talked about earlier, is a very important piece of equipment. And um, let's, let's, touch on that again. You were recommending as far as the placement of the diffusers. What were you saying about that? What do you recommend doing with the well, aerator? If you, have a, if you have a skimmer, then the uh, aeration should be near the skimmer to keep that, that hole open by the skimmer, um, as well as a, uh, a heater, you know, just to keep a hole open there on really bad, uh, you know, freezing uh, winters like we had last year. Um, my aerator alone last year would not have done the job. Um, we had ice buildup over the bubbling area. Uh, so the gases were being kept inside the pond area, not being released. Only with the uh, addition of the heater element was it able to keep it warm enough to keep that hole open in the ice. And that's critical, absolutely critical. Yeah. So, yeah. hey, just to touch a bit back on the iron gen. Listen, the iron yeah. gen is um, simply just, uh, you know, it's a calculated mixture of copper ions, um, and it releases that uh, a path flowing into the water. And that basically is going to be um, uh, reducing the string algae uh, dramatically sometimes, um, uh, you know, in the pond. So that that's a uh, kind of a, a copper ion uh, way uh, uh, way of um, you know breaking down algae and reducing the amount of algae that um, you know string algae that will occur in a pond. Uh, just to touch back on that, um, yeah. But listen, there's no question about this. If you don't have your aeration in your pond and it freezes up, the gases are going to build up, and that's a really bad bad thing for the fish. Uh, you have to keep an open hole uh, that gases have to be released and um, uh, putting that near the, uh, if you're going to run your pond, you're going to put that right near your uh, skimmer so that uh, it also is keeping uh, the skimmer wide open to draw water into the skimmer for the pump. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's kind of a multi-purpose piece of equipment um, during the winter, all year round, but especially during the winter time. And uh, you had said that typically during the height of the season, when we're all enjoying the warmer months, the diffuser for the aerator can go to the bottom of the pond to make sure you're circulating and getting lots of oxygen into the pond. And, and like you said, still releasing gases um, during that time of year. Ammonia, which can build up in ponds, is released as a gas. So and met when you're and methane the surface, as well. Yeah, methane gas exactly. as well. So you, so it's a great way to degas your pond, um, and it's an, it, they're pretty inexpensive to run. So it's a great piece of equipment to have, especially if you don't have a skimmer on your pond. There's, there's a lot of people that may have various types of um, systems, and some of them may not include skimmers. So I would really highly recommend having an aerator in there just to give you at least some gentle circulation. Uh, you're going to be de-icing your pond. You're going to be de-gassing your pond. 
it doesn't cost that much to run. And um, like you were suggesting too, you don't want it in the deepest area of the pond. You want it, uh, if you have shelves, maybe on the top shelf or about mid-depth of your pond, depending on what the, the depth of your pond is. Now, what is a, like aerators as, as a piece of equipment, what does a good aerator tend to cost? For people who are, who are listening to this and they don't have aerators, what can they look at expecting to as a purchase cost for an aerator? Well, I think aerators uh, can vary uh, in cost, but I think you can get a decent aerator someplace for around uh, 85 to $120. Um, you can get a good aerator. A lot of them have, um, you know, the more expensive ones are going to be um, uh, have more ports that you can attach uh, tubes to that you can run aeration to different areas in the pond. Um, yep. But um, they're not very expensive. And neither are the heaters. The heaters can be, you know, pretty similar, even less expensive um, for you. And they really don't draw a whole lot of uh of amperage, uh, so yeah, um, yeah. It, it, it's not like the pump. new one. It's not like your pump running, Mike. You know, your pump is going to yeah. run. You know, cost more to run than than these two items, and these two right. items are just as important, if not more important, for the winter months than a pump. Yeah, and um, I want to let people know too that when you're looking at an aerator, make sure it's it's for the outdoors. Don't. Don't pull an aerator off your aquarium or you have an old aerator, you know, air pump in your basement. Make sure you're getting a pond aerator that's going to be strong enough to aerate your pond, de-ice your pond, circulate, and it's built to be outdoors. Because after a good rainstorm or, or a freezing night, the uh, aerators that are meant for the aquarium industry are not going to do the job. I see a lot of people trying to substitute uh, aquarium equipment for pond equipment, even though they're very close cousins. Um, you don't want to mix those up. Now, we're, the de-icer, you're saying that a de-icer, um, which, to clarify, too, is not a heater um, by any means. They, de-icers don't actually heat ponds. A lot of people tend to refer to them as heaters, um, and they really don't do that. But they do keep your pond, uh, keep at least a, an area of your pond from completely freezing over. And you suggest keeping the de-icer close to the skimmer if you have a skimmer. Uh, which is a great location for that. Right. Um, you know, de-icers uh, are floating devices. Uh, they're going to be, you know, some are as high as 1,250-watt uh, uh, heaters. Uh, others can be much, much less in, in, in uh, wattage. Um, but they're usually both a floating device, and they're just going to be able to keep a vent hole open in the ice to release the gases. Uh, from underneath yeah. the ice, even the smallest of holes will suffice. So, um, cutting or chopping, and it's so funny. I remember some some video where you were chopping through the ice at one point. Do you remember that? Some video yeah. back when? Yeah, and yeah. that must have been a, a stressful situation that you needed to get that hole opened up. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly when that was, but I know that that was a source of uh, stress for you that you had to do that to make sure that you got that hole open because you really, if you don't get those harmful gases removed uh, that are caused by fish waste and plant decay, um, wow, they can become deadly to your fish. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially once you get everything iced over with snow and all that coverage, it, it really can turn um, into a, a terrible situation, which, mm -hmm. which is why we want to be prepared, which is why we're, we're talking about this stuff, so people have good info and they're prepared for the winter, so you don't wake up one morning and find out that you have no access to your pond and, you know, um, your your beloved fish and koi are, are suffering or possibly even dying underneath there. So the de-icer and aerator are two critical pieces of equipment to definitely use for the, the um, winter time and Right. The ice is just it's technology that we stole from the livestock industry. It's the same thing that they use to keep water troughs open for horses and exactly. cattle and sheep. E yeah, exactly. Cool. They go back a long way and they you know, they can be as little as hundred and twenty watt, you know, all the way up even higher than the you know, one thousand two hundred and fifty watt that we use for ponds sometimes too. Yeah. 
and the, those those twelve hundred, twelve fifty watt deicers. I mean, they they actually can keep a very big area of water open, you know, within a pond. I, I use a lot of the three hundred watt uh, deicers. Mm-hmm. That seems to be a pretty good um, power to use for general applications. I mean, there, there are times that you need something bigger. There may be times you need something smaller, but 300 watts really seems to be a good all-purpose um, de-icer. So those, hey, those are very good to have. You don't need anything higher than that. Again, even the smallest of holes will suffice and do the job. Yep. Now, when you are doing the winter prep services for your clients, are you plugging in the de-icer at that time, or do you just stage it? When is the best time to actually plug it in and, and get it going? Well, I usually bring it out for the client, and I leave it near the power source. And um, usually uh, they'll get an email saying, okay, reminder, uh, go ahead and put that in, plug it in now. Uh, some of them are temperature sensitive, uh, and those ones that are usually, I think it's about 37 degrees that they turn on, um, and some aren't. It all depends on the um, ones that you have, the deicers that you have. But uh, um, I try to make uh, as least of uh, a job for the clients as possible, so I'll put things out there for them. But we will put the aerators up to the level and have them going because, you know, aeration in the pond is good all year long. Uh, we'll just oh, yeah. move them up into the upper shelves. But the de-icer will just sit there until uh, they get that email saying, okay, go ahead and pop them in. I should start doing that, Tom. i got to start emailing people that information. <laughs> hey, you learn something new every day. Um, I'm usually telling uh, my customers we, we like to just have everything staged because, you know, this time you, you really don't need your de-icer running especially if you have a more powerful one because they can get a little expensive. As a general rule, I just tell my customers, you know, that that first day that you go out and you see that really thin layer of ice on your pond, that's when it's time to just plug in that de-icer because winter can happen in a heartbeat and, you know, you may have a thin layer of ice one day and and two days later you could have an inch of ice (laughs) on your pond. So that's that's a good time to plug those things in. Um, How much does a... a de-icer cost? Um, a de-icer, you know, I think a de-icer, uh, depending on how many watts that you're getting a de-icer, but, uh, again, you can get a de-icer for as little as, you know, like a 125-watt de-icer. You could get a de-icer for as little as $40. And then you okay. could get, you know, one that's, um, you know, $85, $90 as well. So, um yeah. You can find them, you know, somewhere between those two ranges. Um, and some some ponds you want more than one on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Depending on the size of the pond, um, I would never rely. If it's a larger pond, I wouldn't want to rely on just one de-icer. So, you know, you could, we could probably even come up with a certain square footage of ponds. You know, you want to have a de-icer per X amount of square feet. But... That really is going to depend on the power, because like you said, some are 1,200 watts, some are a heck of a lot less. So it, it really depends on what we have going on. I actually use a de-icer in my pondless water features that stay open for the winter. Uh, it's just a sense of security, and last year they were a necessity to be able to oh, yeah. keep. Oh, absolutely. So in one feature alone, I had one at the upper um up a reverse wetlands and one down at the wetlands area that um, I put one in each side. So just to make sure that the water temperature was just enough high enough that it wasn't going to freeze and it worked well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, um, they are not just great for ponds, but also if you're going to run your pondless waterfall, uh, they should be, you know, purely great for that as well. Right. So, once everybody, you know, you're you're doing your your winter prep. You got all your equipment taken care of. You you got stuff disconnected, put away, cleaned up, dried out. Um, now let's talk about the, the pond, like the the plants, which we we touched on before. Um, plants need to be prepared for winter time as well. And a big part of that, the reason that we're doing that, 
is what you had mentioned. You don't want a lot of organic debris building up in the pond. And pretty typically um, after the first frost, the aquatic plants, they'll start dying off and you don't want them um, decaying in your pond and raising up nutrient levels. So when it comes to dealing with plants, um, let's talk, talk about tropicals real quick. Um, what do you do with most of the tropical plants in your client's ponds? Uh, when you're winterizing it? Well, unless my client has a greenhouse, uh, which most do not, but I have two that actually do, um, well, those tropicals are purely treated as an annual, and they are removed and they're done for the season. Um, if they have a greenhouse, then um, they can go in their greenhouse and be kind of kept alive. They're not going to thrive there. Um, because unless your greenhouse is totally heated, um, they will perish. But uh, you can have them survive. But the funny thing is they really never come back as strong as when you pick one up at a, uh, at a uh, water garden shop. Uh, you're never really going to get that same bloom that year for some reason. It just doesn't seem to do as good. So tropicals, we really treat like annuals, and they come out, and we're in most cases they're um, they're discarded. Yeah, and that's that's pretty much my approach as well. Any of the the floating tropicals like water hyacinth, water lettuce, those are just they're just thrown out or they're composted. They actually make really good compost. Mm -hmm. um, so we would compost those. You don't want to leave those in there at all because after the first freeze, they will they sink, they rot. So those are really important to get your, your floating plants out of there. Um, some of the other tropicals, let's say canna and taro. Um, first of all, don't ever try to eat taro. Did you see that posting by Dan Put, one of his guys? <laughs> uh, so I saw, I saw ate, that. Ate a piece I of taro. <laughs> I, I saw that. And I called yeah. my wife over to look at the picture of the lips that were blown up so large. And I said, look. And she said, oh, my gosh. This is just something that similarly happened to our daughter where she had bitten in on a uh, green Granny Smith apple. And whatever the uh, ethylene that was used to kind of make that apple become ripe on its trip from south to north – that amount yeah. of ethylene made her lips blow up even more than what you saw in that picture. Wow. So, yeah, yeah it was terrifying, actually. Uh, hideous yeah. looking. But, yes, um, I saw that. That was quite interesting and a sense of amusement for us, actually. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's really important advice when you're winterizing your pond, do not eat your tropical plants. <laughs> Throw them out. Just, just get rid don't of them. eat. Don't eat anything. <laughs> you can eat your fish, exactly. but don't eat them. <laughs> yeah, that's the most important advice we can give all night. Don't eat your tropical plants. But, but uh, the, bottom, know, cool, the bottom line, the bottom line, Mike, again with the uh, the plant material is simple. You know, you take your tropicals and you can compost them or whatever. You know, that's fine. Uh, tropicals aren't going to really come back to you. Uh, they're not going to be something that you're going to be sinking to the bottom. I don't treat um, uh, things that come back uh, as a tropical, um, you know, so anything that's going to come back, your water lilies um, <clears throat> that are hardy are going to be sunk down to the bottom. Uh, you want to keep them as low as possible. Um, and, um, uh, everything else that is or that's going to decay really should be removed from the pond uh, because yeah. the least amount of organic matter that you have, the better off your fish are going to be coming uh, coming out of this uh, coming into the spring. So reduce right. the amount of organic matter. That's and that again is something that starts now, not in the dead of winter. You do that now. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Just. Cut to the chase and, and get the plants uh, cut back or thrown out. Um, some of the, you know, taro and canna, those could be used as a house plant if somebody really, really wants to try to save them, but otherwise just throw them out. And then, um, you know, we typically, for the lilies, we pinch them back to the crown of the plant. If there's any right. new leaf growth underwater, 
uh, we don't touch that. So any of that new growth that still is submerged, we're, put it this way, we're only pinching back the stuff that has already come to the surface mm-hmm. or that is you know, just below the surface and spent any other growth. We just let it be uh, because it'll, it'll actually hang out during the wintertime and spring it'll be off and running again. Um, now, with the marginals and stuff, do you, because I think there's two ways to approach it, do you sink your marginals down in the water or do you just leave them where they are? No, I just leave them where they are. If they're if they're you know within six inches of the top, um, they're pretty yep. hardy. They're pretty hardy. I yep. just you know cut back the uh, marginals that uh, obviously you can see that they're ready to cut back. It's it's almost like you treat a hosta, where you know when it's done, it it, it starts to get fleshy and weak. And you just cut cut it back, and they're hardy enough right. that they'll come back. So I don't remove the marginals from their uh, from their areas uh, around the edge of the the pond. Uh, um, it's it's really you know again with the water lilies, I just don't want the crowns to freeze. So you know right. I just keep them down so that the crowns don't freeze. And uh, yeah. And otherwise, yeah, again, I, I, I just think um, you know. Uh, remove as much of that fleshy growth as possible. Get all the leaves out of the pond that you possibly can get out. Some people actually put nets and keep the nets over the pond in the winter. Now, I don't. I do in the fall, but I do in the fall because it's for me. It's a it, it's a great sense of not having to do, do so much work coming into the winter months. Uh, but right. but I think you know I have clients that actually we keep their. Um, you know, two clients actually keep their pond netted all winter long. And um, yeah. it, just, it just helps out with the amount of debris that they don't have to deal with in the spring. Right. There's some strategies to keep keeping it on. And, of course, mm-hmm. you want the plants, plants cut back prior to that. Now, my, my habit when cutting back marginals is usually to leave about four inches above the water, mm-hmm. um, you know, for canna, iris, stuff like that. Um, and... Like we just talked about, we don't submerge the plants at all. I know that there's there's people out there who do. They they have a practice of taking, you know, their beautiful marginal plants that are thriving, their pickerel and their iris or whatever they, it is, and then they put them on the bottom of the pond. And I think that's a mistake. I think you're actually subjecting your plant to a very stressful uh, condition. And you're basically flooding the plant. You're putting it into a state of flooding during the winter. And these plants can take flood conditions. They can take dry conditions. That's why they're marginals. They're used to having a little more or less water and they're, they're hardy. I mean, they're, they're pretty bulletproof. So if anybody is out there and you're taking plants and sinking them to the bottom, don't do that. If your plants are doing well where they're located, they're happy and they're growing during the season, like Tom is suggesting, just cut them on back down to just above the crown of the plant. And they'll do just fine during the winter. They can handle those freezing conditions, um, have good trust in those marginal plants because they're just kind of genetically programmed to deal with freezing weather and dry conditions. Some some ponds, I don't use a lot of it. Some ponds use, um, some pond keepers use submerged weeds like Anacharis, Elodia in their ponds. Um, what do you recommend as far as how to deal with some of the, and I don't mean lilies, but the submerged weed type of plants that people sometimes introduce into their ponds. How, what, you, what about for winter on those plants? Well, you, know, you got me on that one because I really don't have any applications of that. Yeah. I see people will, will kind of, I don't use them, I don't introduce them myself because they are truly weeds and they're going to take over your pond at some point. So for those people who are using uh, the aerators, anacris, hornwort, coontail, stuff like that, my suggestion is to heavily thin those out or even remove them because they're inexpensive plants to replace. So if you're in the habit of using those, take them out because they will die um, and they're going to, I mean, they they may come back in the spring, but they're going to die off. They usually get pretty abundant, so you're going to lose quite a bit of them. Um, and they are really a, a good way to drive up nutrients. So if you can get rid of those, pull those suckers out, and just get new ones during the springtime, and I think that's a great way to deal with submerged plants. And uh, this time of year is not really a time of year to do any fertilizing for the plants either. You don't recommend using any sort of fertilizer this time of year 
in hopes that in the springtime they're going to grow like bananas, right? You know, this isn't turf grass. You're not giving a winter fertilizer for early green spring, <laughs> you know, green up. That's yep. that's not, uh, we're not doing that here. Um, these plants are going into dormancy. Uh, they should be, if they're, if they're in the pots, they should be well root bound at that point. If they're if they're creeping out of the pots and they're into your gravel, they should be pretty root bound as well going through the gravel. Uh, they should be fine for the winter. Um, can they freeze? Yeah, if we have a really tough winter, uh, some plants will get some freezing and, and uh, not come back, and some will partially come back. But this isn't some, I think fertilizing your plants at this time of year is purely a waste of money. I agree. So we're we're walking through the process. We got our equipment taken care of. We got our plants all cut back and taken care of and prepped for the winter. And now it comes time to um, net the pond. And you were talking about netting ponds just a moment ago. What are the benefits of netting a pond this time of year? What what are some of the things that people who don't net their ponds? What should they consider, and why do you recommend it? I recommend it uh, if you want less work coming into the spring. You're going to have a lot less debris to clean out uh, because it's going to be sitting on the top of your net. Um, it's something that um, you know when you're not when you don't have a lot of ice buildup or snow on the net, and you have um, material there that you can you know on a winter day come and blow it off or rake it off. Um, you know, it, for for me, it also is a, a plus and a negative because I think it also detracts from the beauty of a pond um, when you don't have the snow and ice over it. Um, anything to me that's not natural uh, takes away from the pond. Um, so for my own home, I do not net. Um, once we're done with all the leaves here, which which should be, oh, maybe in a couple more weeks here, we should be all done. Um and we'll blow off around the pond. Uh, any of the leaves that come into the pond for the winter at that point is purely uh, a case of going out there and doing a little bit of winter maintenance, uh, trying to fish out any of the leaves. But uh, people, some people just don't want that, you know, extra maintenance, and they'll go ahead and, and put a net over the pond for the winter, um, which is fine. Just it's not my preferred method here at my own home. So netting greatly reduces your maintenance this time of year while leaves are really, really coming down. Because you can have days where if you have a skimming system, you may have to clean your skimmer three times a day, you know, because the leaves just come down in such quantity. So netting can really, really reduce maintenance quite a bit. So that is, is definitely a benefit I think everybody should, should consider. When we're talking about netting, what type of netting do you recommend? Because netting may mean different things to different people. What type of netting do you recommend? Well, it can't be a very thin netting. It has to be something that can be stretched and can be take some weight um, on there. Um, you know, pond netting is, um, oh, can be thick, like, uh, not quarter inch, but probably three and three eighths inch netting um, can be used. Um, it's um, you know a lot of the netting that is used now is kind of like a multi-purpose netting. Um, it's it's a rolled netting. It comes it's convenient uh, to to install. It's easy to install. Um, but, it, it, you know, a lot of these packages, netting packages come with stakes and uh, it's reusable. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, like a, it's like a woven poly uh, material that's resistant to tearing, that type of netting. Um, and it, it usually should last for a number of years. Um, and some, net, some netting, of course, is thicker than others and will last a lot longer. But, um, you know, your typical... Pond netting is um, something that we just give our uh, size of the ponds to our distributors, and we tell them whether we want, you know, something that's 14 by 20 or 28 by 30, or there's, you know, all different size. There's stock sizes, and then you can have them custom cut. So um, right. it really just depends. But um, it is, without a doubt, one of the ways that you can reduce greatly the amount of work that you need to do 
going into the winter. And we, we actually have had our, our nets up for a month now, quite almost a month. Wow. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So you're, you're prepared. And it is. It's, it's, as far as preparing for a successful winter season, um, netting is that this time of year is, is really important. I use, um, you know, same thing. I, I use a heavy duty net that can be used. I usually get two to three years out of the netting that we use for our customers. Um, it's got to be able to stretch tight. Many years ago, I used to get economy netting, um, which is also sometimes just called bird netting or generic leaf netting. And it just breaks and tears. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, it's mm-hmm. just way too easily. You get a few leaves on there and a rainstorm and boom, the thing is just ripped apart because it can't handle any weight at all. So the netting we have that, that I'm using is, is a quarter inch gauge. So, you know, fish food can still get through there if you're feeding your fish, but leaves and stuff like that, even um, acorns, unless they're really small, cannot get through, um, mm-hmm. which is really nice. You Now, what's your method of installing netting? Because I see people doing all sorts of stuff from stretching it tight to using poles to creating canopies and tents. And I mean, some people, my gosh, they they build houses over their ponds (laughs) for the winter season. (laughs) I've seen some doozies. Well, to me, less is better. The the least visible is the best for me. I'm, I'm fine with even having the netting be slightly suspended over the water's edge um, and, and kept taut as possible as it possibly, you know, could be. Um, most of the netting we use is like half inch by half inch openings. So, um, you know, the whole size is um, not going to let the leaves in, but yet we can still, you know, fee, uh, fish, uh, feed the fish, as you were saying. Um, uh, I, I just think that the the, to keep the netting as close to the water's edge is, is fine for me. Some people do the pole deals and make that tent, and um, I don't know. You know, yeah. it's, it's not so pleasing to have something that in nature that looks man-made, and that looks so man-made to me that if the lower it is and it's taut uh, to the pond, uh, you know, just above the water's edge is probably the best for, for, for our applications anyway. Yeah, I'm with you. I would say 90% of the ponds that, that we deal with for doing winter preparations, we use the stretch tight method. Um, we just take it, we stretch it around the, the pond, we staple it into, you know, into the ground, or we use rocks to kind of weigh it down and keep it in place. Um, we do a couple of ponds where we're doing poles, you know, PVC poles and pipes and all this kind of stuff. But it, it really is, like you're saying, not too pleasant to look at. Um, it's not really that much of a benefit to go through that extra trouble of, of tenting it and all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, a lot of times the, the PVC pipes just bend and, you know, you, you just kind of have a mess on your hands after that. So I, I like what you recommend with a straight, you know, stretch your netting real tight. It looks good. It's functional. And um, it's easy to deal with when it comes to taking it off and putting it up. It's just it's a little less work to do on your pond. Um, so Less, less uh, is yeah. better. <laughs> to me, less, less is, is better. better. <laughs> yes. No doubt. Now, what about our fish? I mean, that, that's what this is all about, ponds and, and having fish. And, uh, you know, some people may think that they have, have ponds and they have to move their fish indoors. Some people may have to. I mean, depending on your pond, you may have to move your fish indoors. Not the way we build ponds. The fish can stay out all year round. Um, what are some of the things that you recommend to prepare your fish for the wintertime? Well, I got to take you back to your last show because you stressed what I think is the most important factor of all. And that is when, before the temperatures get too low, start fattening up your fish. You know, they're going to be without, yeah. they're going to be without their staple um, diet. You know, they're going to miss that feeding that they were having on a daily basis uh, for, you know, seven months out of the year, eight months, depending on where you live. And they're going to be starting to go into hibernation. Uh, and you really need to give them everything you can uh, 
for them to make it through this through the winter. And so by uh, feeding them a little bit more, fattening them up for the winter is a great thing to do. Yeah, I agree. What, what they're eating now is what they're going to burn during the winter time. During the rest of the season, when it's, you know, the height of the season, May, June, July, um, August, all those, those times of year, the, the feedings that we're giving are, are basically just maintenance feedings because the fish are kind of metabolizing everything that they're eating at such a high rate because of water temperatures and their activity levels are really, really high. So, I mean, for me, I almost start the, the winter prep for my fish towards the end of August. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's when I start mentally saying, you know what, winter's right around the corner. It's time to kind of power feed these guys. And uh, I'll let them, you know, late August through the rest of the season until they stop eating, until they, they tell me I'm done, I don't want any more, um, or the temperatures dictate that. I feed them as much as they want to eat and let them eat and let them eat. It also is a great way to get out by your pond and enjoy the tail end of the season. You know, it's, um, you know, you, you want to enjoy your pond too. No, exactly, exactly. Uh, and again, something that you just mentioned, your fish will tell you when they are slowing down. Um, and if you see a lot of your food in the skimmer, um, you're feeding too much. So, I, you know, it's that five minute rule. Feed your fish what they can eat in five minutes. If you have yeah. a lot of excess food, and it, then they don't need that food, and it will get less and right. less. It will get less and less as the temperatures drop. So, yeah. uh, but again, I think still before the temperatures drop, that whole premise of fattening them up, uh, I think is great. And we don't need to build any treadmill for our fish, by the way. Oh, my fish are very well exercised, I have to say. <laughs> and uh, you're not going to make out any wheat pasta recipes, are you? <laughs> no. I actually thought that was quite quite amusing. And uh, I went out and fed pasta to the fish, and the pasta just sank to the bottom. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> well, it's a certain type of pasta. I, I, you know, I, I think they like rigatoni. If you're not giving them the rigatoni, hey. Well, mine but, um, was angel hair, angel hair pasta, and I just watched it float to the bottom. I said, "Okay, well, if they eat it, I'm not going to know about it anymore." So, yeah. <laughs> but again, um, so not that, so not again that with your fish. We're recommending that. What's that now? I said, "Not that we're recommending giving your fish pasta." <laughs> no, but you know, um, hey, whatever works. Um, um, you know, you're really looking to do uh, at this time of year. You really want a wheat germ based food uh, because, you know, they can't really, once your temperatures get, you know, below 55, you know, 60 to 50, they don't digest protein very well. So using kind of a wheat germ based, uh, which has more carbs and protein, uh, is something that they handle better. And then really, you know, this number floats around a bit. Uh, Some people say it's 55 degrees. Some people say it's 50. But Definitely by 45 degrees, you should not be feeding your fish. And if you have done your job, if you've, if your pond is clean and you're not worried about the amount of organic debris in the pond, you know, your fish are going to live the winter fine. They're going to be good. And whether yeah. you can see them or not, um, I think you can be rest assured that if you've done your job in the fall, winter, you know, beginning of the winter to keep your pond clean, prep it for winter, do all these things that we've just spent this time talking about, um, you really can be assured that your fish are going to come out having a, uh, into the spring and they're going to be, you know, uh, abundant. They're going to be fine. Um, right. So, you know, doing those things. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people stress out that uh, winter's coming. You know, I wonder if the fish are going to make it. You know, oh, I can't tell you how often I hear that. I wonder how the fish are going to do. Well, yeah. Co- yeah. coming out of last year, um, I saw the least amount of fish die off in any of the years. So, you know, and that was our worst winter that I've seen. Yeah. So yeah. if you do your if you do your job right. If you do your, if you prep your pond and your clients' ponds, 
and you make everything the way that you feel is done correctly, you can go to sleep for the winter knowing your fish are going to be great and they'll come out fine. Right. Exactly. If they follow the simple guidelines that we just kind of discussed, they're going to have a successful winter, which means they're going to have a successful spring. And um, Tom, thank you so much for coming on and sharing this information with the listeners. I mean, it's, it's a really important time of year. This is a critical season uh, to kind of know what you're doing and to prep your pond. And I think the guidelines you laid out were, were awesome. And um, again, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate your time and uh, your information, and, and I hope you'll come on again sometime. Mike, always my pleasure. Uh, you're a great thank CAC you. mentor for all of us, so thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. All right, Tom. Well, listen, have a great night, and uh, I hope the rest of the season goes well for you. I hope uh, you get a little more golf in as well, and I will be catching up with you soon. Thank you, Mike. Take care. Okay, take care.